Hallelujah! Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. 
Hallelujah. Man, I have just been dying to say that. First time, pastor gets to say that. And it's also the news that we've been dying to get to hear, isn't it? As we've journeyed with Christ, see him placed upon that cross to pay for the sins of the entire world, the sins of you and me. And then today we get to travel to that tomb to see that it is empty. That Christ is not here. He is risen just as he said he would. And then our new resurrection life from this day forward would just be beginning. Well, good morning and wel welcome to worship here at St. Paul's. It's such a privilege and an honor to get to worship with all of you here, packed in God's house as we celebrate this resurrection victory. And for all you guests out there that are worshiping with us, we want you to know that we just counted a special privilege to have you here among us. We hope you'll experience uh, God among us the way we do here in this family of faith. And uh, we're just so thankful to have you here. May God be with you and your family and your friends as you celebrate this Easter season. And uh, we just want to begin now... Uh, with uh, just welcoming each other to worship here, and then we're going to have a special Easter children's reading. So let's stand and say to one another, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed, as we greet each other this morning. Kids, you go ahead and come up. And I invite our children forward. And as we gather before our triune God, we make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please pray with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you such thanks and praise on a day like today. A day that would be like any other, Lord. When you sent your son down from heaven to earth to live among us, to die on a cross for us, and then to take his life up again in three days, to be raised from the dead so that we would no longer be covered in death, but covered in the life that is your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for this precious gift. Help us to take this Easter celebration and turn it into a lifestyle in you, Lord, a lifestyle that flows out from this gathering into the rest of our lives and worlds, Lord, as we proclaim who you are to all those we come into contact with. We thank you for this precious gift. Help us to always truly value what you have done for us and help us to always live in and for you. It's in your holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. Our Lord, who died on Easter Friday, but the cross did not destroy. His resurrection on Easter morn, that fills our hearts with joy. When he set about his work that God sent him to do, he took our punishment on himself. He made us clean and new. Amen.
children to read our scripture with us today. From the book of John, if you would like to look it up yourself, there is some pew Bibles in the pews in front of you, or you can take out your Bible, or you can look it up on your device and you version on the Bible. John chapter 20, beginning with verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where to put him. Or they have put. So Peter, so Peter and the other disciple got into the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there before Magdalene. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separated from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed and stri- did not understand from scripture, scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their home, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? So they took my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will come and get him.
Father, what an amazing thing it is that you've done for us, that you would devise a plan of salvation, that you would take the guilt of a whole broken world and you would put the blame and the, and the suffering for that guilt and sin all on your own son and that you'd condemn him to death, even forsake him on the cross that would lead him to cry out in agony, God, even you've forsaken me. Then to lay him in the tomb only for three days and to raise him to life again to show that you were pleased with his sacrifice, that indeed the debt of sin is canceled and that because he lives, we're going to live forever. Lord, uh, praise and thank you. Hallelujah forever. Amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bible with you this morning, I want to take you back to John chapter 20, uh, the, the uh, core text that the kids read earlier. And I want to focus especially on the conversation with Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was a, a woman who met Jesus when she was tangled up in sin of every variety. The scriptures tell us that seven demons uh, had been delivered from her. Uh, she was known as a loose woman, uh, probably um, tangled up in all kinds of uh, you know, unimaginable dysfunctions in life. But she found hope in Jesus. And she followed him intensely. In our text for today, it's probably the second visit to the tomb that she made on Easter morning. Uh, she went with three women earlier at the very, very break of day. Uh, and they got a message that Jesus wasn't there, that he was raised back to life. And, and the rest went back uh, into the city, but she was not at peace. And she went back and she said, something's wrong here. I, I, this, this can't be. And here's the dialogue that happened when she came back for this second visit. Beginning uh, in verse 10. The disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said to her, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. In real life, there are issues and then there are issues. There are decisions to make and then there are real decisions we have to make. There are crises and then there are out of proportion, off the chart crises. When a five-year-old grandson uh, learning to ride his bike for the first time uh, falls and skins his knee and he comes to his papa and, he, and he's crying incessantly and he just can't get over the, the blood's oozing out of his kneecap, you know, we rub it a little bit and uh, we might wash it off and we say, you know, it's, it's going to be okay. This is not a matter of life and death. It'll be fine. When Captain Patrick Soderheim bangs on the cockpit door, of German Wings Flight 9525 to rescue a descending plane from crashing into the Alps. A decision had to be made, and he's trying his best to break in and retrieve the controls because it is a matter of life and death, and terrible tragedy is about to result. There are many decisions that we make every day that are quite insignificant. We're going to go to Coffee Connection or we're going to stop by Starbucks. Want cream or you want sugar? Ah, put both in. That really sweetens it up, you know? You want paper or plastic if you go to the grocery store? Ah, it depends on how ecologically minded you are. Coke or Pepsi? I can deal with either one, you know, especially on a hot day. Those things don't matter. We have to decide, but they're not a big deal. But what we talk about here today, friends, is a big deal. It matters 
life and death. What we do with Jesus, how we embrace this resurrection victory, how we come to him and the attitude of our hearts and how we move from beyond just knowing that he lived and died, that 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 was a real history lesson somewhere, and how we respond to that by letting him be the Lord of our lives and letting him change the direction of who we are and how we live and allowing him to mold and shape our future for whatever he wants to do in our life. That level of surrender, that confidence in Jesus, that willingness to trust him even to the very end is a big deal. And how we respond to this resurrection victory makes all the difference in the world. I'm struck as I read this gospel lesson by the response here of Mary Magdalene. As she comes on Sunday morning here to the tomb, obviously emotionally trashed. She has watched Jesus hang on the cross and suffer and die. She has seen people mistreat him, curse at him, put crowns of thorns on him. She stood by helplessly as they nailed him to the wood of the cross. She's heard him cry out, I'm thirsty. It is finished. I'm forsaken. And the the level of emotional turmoil in her has to be off the charts. This person changed her life. He meant more than any other person ever meant to her. And to watch him mire down here now, being mistreated, thrown under the bus, people walk away, She has a hard time dealing with that. When others come to finish a burial detail and anoint him with spices, she's there. But they can't find him. An angel gives a message, and according to Luke's account, he's not here, he's risen. Um, But she's not okay with that. She hasn't seen him. I don't know that I can believe that. That's too good to be true. So she goes back. And she searches every crook and cranny of the garden to find him. She comes back to the tomb and the angels greet her. They have a question for her. Why are you crying? She says, well, they've taken my Lord away and I don't know where they put him. She turns around and someone she perceives to be a gardener asks the exact same question. Why are you crying? Now, I want to tell you that both Jesus and the angel knew the answer to that question. They're not asking her, why are you crying, to try to get new information. But they're challenging her to express the level of doubt in her heart. She's already heard the message. He's not here. He's risen. She already knew days before. Jesus had said very clearly, uh, they're gonna, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'll be treated shamefully. I'll fall into the hands of sinful men. And I'm going to die. But on the third day, I'll rise again. She knew that message. She heard that message. But at this moment, doubt is bigger than faith. She's unable to grasp that reality. And she's on a search to do what makes common sense. And that's find the body of Jesus. So where have you put him? People every day believe wrong answers. She was living with a wrong answer in life. She had a wrong conclusion that she would find the body of Jesus somewhere on the outskirts of Jerusalem. And she was pursuing that agenda with great fervor and dedication. Friends, in the world today, people are pursuing sick agendas based on false understandings and information. Some people believe that if we put enough political pressure in our culture today, we can gain acceptance of immoral behaviors and it'll be just fine. Life will go on. They're operating on misinformation, untruth that our culture has embraced unfounded, 
godless perspectives about core morality. Thinking, if we twist enough arms, it'll become acceptable. Some people believe to this day that uh, if you have enough of the good things of this life, if, that if we uh, have enough success and we have enough wealth and we, we have enough of our friendships with the right people, that life will be grand and glorious and it'll fill the deep longings of our soul. And the scriptures tell us again and again, life doesn't consist in the abundance of our possessions, that there's only one thing needful. And that's a relationship with the living Lord Jesus Christ. But we, we operate on different assumptions. There's a whole group of people in the world today, we call them terrorists, who believe that they please and honor their God by killing Christian, God-fearing, innocent people. And that somehow the world should stand by and the, and the world should rejoice in that. There was a guy at the seat of this airplane that flew into the side of this mountain on the screen here who believed that the right way to deal with his depression and the life perspective that he had come to embrace was to fly an airplane into the side of the French Alps killing 150 total people. Wrong information, acting on untruths, just exactly what Mary Magdalene was doing. Friends, it can happen to you and me. We meet hard places in life, and uh, rather than putting our confidence that God can turn hard things into good, Rather believing that God can heal wounds in our lives, we take things into our own hands and we're going to act on it and uh, we're going to throw away whatever's in the way of what I want to do in life and we press on with our own strength and our own ingenuity to solve the problems and issues in our life. And it never gets us to the right place. We find ourselves uh, often believing that I don't really need God. And we wouldn't say that. But we find ourselves at a level of priority, living for what I got to do, what I want to do, trying to keep body and soul together, and believing that if, if I work and apply myself a little harder, stress out a little more, invest a little more of my energy, that somehow it'll get me to the right place. And we end up trying. It doesn't work. We're broken. We're looking for the wrong things in the wrong places. The picture on your screen is a picture of uh, Jesus in Oklahoma City. It stands outside the Alfred B. Murrah Center where at the tragic blow up of this federal building, uh, Lives were lost. The place was leveled. Innocent children were sacrificed. And it's a picture of Jesus weeping and crying. Mary wept, but what she didn't know was that Jesus wept. And he wept for her. He weeps for you. He weeps for me. He wept over the city of Jerusalem to see it mired in untruth and hypocrisy going the wrong way. Friends, that's so crucial today that we're able to believe right things. That we're able to build our lives on real truth. Every one of you is loved by Jesus. The issue in our text that resolved all the anxieties for, for Mary on this day was just to hear Jesus call her name when he said to her, Mary. The light went on. She was alive. What is promised is true. 
He did care for her. He did mean it when he said, on the third day, I'll rise again. And she fell at his feet in honor and worship of him and the great victory that he had earned for her. Friends, today, Jesus calls you by name. He's here today to say, you matter to me. I know about the false presuppositions you have in life. I know the things that often drive you that are not of, that are not of me. I know the places that you've tried to get to and the things you've tried to buy into and the answers you've tried to find for yourself. And I know they're not going to work for you. And I see it when you don't find peace. I'm aware when you're crying on the inside and maybe on the outside. I watch when your life boils down to dysfunction and upheaval and tragedy strikes. And you start running on empty. And one by one, he calls me by name. And he calls you by name. And I think there is a nudge of chastisement in that. Mary... Didn't I tell you? Don't you remember? Have you forgotten what I said to you? But there's an even greater sense of great love and concern. Mary. And he welcomed her back. And he received her with joy. And the scriptures go on to tell us that Mary became a a devoted follower of Jesus and, and invested her life fully in making known this great salvation that Jesus had earned for her. And friends, it's what you and I came to be about today. We're here to fall at his feet and worship him. What happened on the cross and on Easter Sunday makes every difference. Those who know and profess Jesus will have everlasting life. Those who ignore Jesus and walk away from him and live life without him will perish eternally. It's worse than flying into the side of a mountain. It's worse than life boiling down to some tragedy. They are eternally excluded from the presence of the Lord where there will not be just weeping for a moment, but the scripture says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth forever. That's what hangs in the balance. What do you do with Jesus? Do you believe his promise to you this morning? That he's with you. That he loves you more than you love yourself. That he understands why you are crying. Just like he understood why Mary was crying. He understands why there's sadness in your heart sometimes. But he wants you to know he's all you need. And when he calls your name, your fears, your anxieties, your worries, your sadness, the dark things in your life, they evaporate. He is Lord for you. He is sufficient for you. His grace is big enough to see you through. Sometimes I look at the world today and my heart gets sad. I see the changes that occur in our culture and, and I realize that the agenda's are not of God. I recognize that there are powerful forces that work in our world today uh, to undermine our Christian faith. I recognize that in Kenya here this week, uh, 147 people were killed just because they professed Jesus. And that's a, almost a daily or at least a weekly occurrence in the world today. There is war on believers in Christ Jesus. And sometimes I begin to scratch my head and I say, where will this end? I'll tell you where it's going to end. It's going to end with Jesus victorious. It's going to end with believers finding the strength in their Savior alone to fix what's wrong in the world. It's going to find with you and me holding fast in faith and even be willing if suffering is called for us to count it joy, as did the early believers, that they were worthy of suffering for the name of Christ. We cannot cower in fear. 
We cannot look with disgust and sadness and feel all is lost. We stand with a victorious Jesus who took on the stronghold of evil and Satan himself and put it to bed. And in his name, we will be victorious. It's a day to celebrate that victory. Jesus once said to his disciples in Matthew 10, don't fear those who can destroy your body. Rather fear him who could destroy both soul and body in hell. Don't be afraid of what the world can do to you. I'll be there for you. My grace is always sufficient. In your weakness, my strength is made perfect. I can take bad things and turn them into good. All things work together for good to those who love God. And we're here today to believe the right thing. And not to emotionally become crippled. Or in our life perspective to become wounded. To celebrate. Jesus lives and reigns for all eternity. I remember once when our oldest son was three years old, Sherwin and I were on a vacation uh, down in Florida. Some of you have just come back from Florida. We were there in the summertime in a little town of Pensacola up in the panhandle of Florida. We had relatives there. Uh, and they invited us uh, to their pool, and we were uh, lounging around the pool, and David was kind of roaming around and uh, just trying to entertain himself. We actually wanted to read a book and catch a little uh, suntan. And... Uh, he was watching other kids, uh, older and bigger than he was, jump in and swim across the pool, and he acted on wrong information. He believed he could do the same thing, so he never knew how to swim. And the water was four feet deep, and he was three feet tall. And by God's grace, uh, a young man was there who saw what uh, had escaped our momentary vision, even though we weren't totally derelict parents. And uh, he jumped in the water, and it's over his head, and uh, he as began to panic, and he jumps in and pulls him out and lays him on the side and uh, scared, scared the tar out of him. Could have been tragic. Acted on wrong information. Thankfully, it was but a blip on the radar screen of our lives. Many people act today on the wrong information that a life without Christ can be a perfectly fulfilling life. How sad. How important that you and I know what we believe. That we can come as sinners into the presence of God and find forgiveness. That he knows us by name and the scripture says he has our name written on the palm of his hand. That he called us by name the day we were baptized. And in the words of Isaiah 43, he says, I have called you by name, you are mine. And when you walk through the rivers, they'll not rush over you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. You are precious and honored in my sight, and I love you. I invite you to accept that truth, to lay your lives before Jesus, to acknowledge your sins and failures as I acknowledge mine in his presence, and to know that the resurrection victory cancels every deficit and will carry us safe to life here and life forever. I'm the resurrection and the life, he says. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. That's truth that you can stand on. God grant it for Jesus' sake. Amen. We take a moment right now just to come clean with our God and uh, to acknowledge to him that sometimes we steer off course. There's a prayer of confession. It's in your worship folder for you. It acknowledges my sin and I hope can acknowledge your sin. I invite you to uh, quietly pray this prayer with me that we might come to clear out anything offensive that would separate us from our God. Church, pray with me. So often, Lord, we are troubled and frustrated over the wrong things. We complain about hard decisions to make, hard problems to solve, hard burdens to carry, and hard relationship issues to resolve. We cry over things that have little eternal significance. 
We obsess over things in the end that do not matter. Forgive our misplaced priorities, our devotion to things that do not last, and our lack of complete confidence in the victory over death you have won for us. Forgive all our sins and give us lasting peace in knowing the battle has been won and the victory is ours. In the name of our risen Savior, Jesus, we pray. Amen. If I could recite all of your names, in the name of Jesus, I would say every one of your names. That as he calls to you, he calls you by name. He wants you to know he loves you. He forgives you. You matter to him. The sin that lives in your heart and life, the regrets that you have about your past, the mistakes you've made, don't separate you from him. You're loved, forgiven, claimed forever. May you rejoice in his mercy and forgiveness. Amen. One of the ways that we show joy to Jesus is by giving back to him. Mary Magdalene came to give back, first of all, to anoint his dead body. She came to honor him by finding him when he was, uh, she believed, uh, laid in the tomb. But when she met him again, she honored him by first worshiping him and then living her life for him. May we tell everybody, Jesus is what matters. As we bring our gift to him, it's one way that we give back. If you're a guest here, we don't have uh, any expectation. Your presence here is your gift to us. Uh, we do invite all of you to find one of the worship cards in the pew racks in front of you, fill those out, pass them toward the center, and our ushers, when they come down the aisles, will gather them. God's peace.
the worship cards are being gathered, I would invite uh, all of our new families to come and join us up here in the chancel, if you would please. As they're coming up, I uh, just want to say to everybody here tonight that it's always a great joy to receive guests into our uh, midst here, and it's a joy to see some of those guests who decide this is a great church to call home church. Uh, and these people that you see coming up uh, have uh, spent about uh, somewhere a little over a dozen Thursday nights with us um, studying and learning and growing together what we believe. Uh, and so it is just a great honor for us to uh, officially welcome them into our family of faith here that we call St. Paul's. We invite all of you, and we're going to ask them some questions. Uh, they're just core questions about what we believe, and uh, those are going to be on the screen for you. And so we're going to invite you to, to say these responses along with them so that they know they're joining other people who believe exactly the same things. So dear friends in Christ, the members of St. Paul's are excited that our Lord has led you to us and that you desire in your hearts to become members of this Christian family. We look forward to many years of serving with you. In Matthew 10, Jesus says, Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. As an opportunity for all of us to reflect on what it means to be a member of this Christian congregation, as an, and as an opportunity for us to rejoice in your confession of faith, I ask you, do you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Savior from sin, death, and the devil? Yes, yes. Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ is, is my Savior. Savior. Do you accept that the Old and New Testaments are the inspired, inerrant Word of God and the final authority in our lives? Yes, yes I, I do. do. Do you accept and confess the teachings of the Evangelical Lutheran Church as you have learned them are faithful and true to the Word of God? Yes, I do. As a member of this congregation, do you intend to worship faithfully and regularly, partake of the Lord's Supper frequently as commanded by Jesus, and provide Christian training for yourself and your family? I, I do, do so, so intend with the help of God. Do you intend to live a Christ-honoring life, keeping from immoral behavior and sinful acts and attitudes, seeking to live in a pure, God-pleasing way? I do so intend with the help of God. Do you intend to contribute as God has blessed you of your time, talents, and treasure toward the ministry of this congregation and the extension of the church at large? I do, I do so, so intend with, with the help of God. God. Upon these, your promises, I, in the name of St. Paul's Lutheran Church, welcome you to our fellowship and acknowledge you as members and invite you to share with us in all the gifts that the Lord Jesus has for his church to join us in worship and ministry. God's peace and his power be with you. May our God give us many years of worshiping and serving him together. You guys are awesome, and I just want to tell you what a joy it's been to uh, share God's word with you and to be among you, and uh, it's been a great privilege for me. Can we welcome these people into the family of You may go with me. What an amazing God we have, amen? <laughs> to see the church grow, to see our life in Christ just blossom forth as we look on the life that he has given for us to live. And it just amazes me to look out and see a church that is living and active just as our God is, just as his word is for us. May God always give us this spirit of power to boldly proclaim, proclaim what he has done for us, that we would always share this with those in our lives. We continue now by coming before our God in a time of prayer just to give thanks for all that God has done for us and to know that when Christ died for us, that temple curtain was tore, that now there is no barrier between God and man. Christ is our mediator and he hears our prayers, the cries of our hearts, and the spirit of our God carries them forward. To our Father's throne. We remember to especially pray for those who are in need at this time, especially for those who are in need of healing, who cannot celebrate the way many of us will be able to celebrate today with our families in light of this Easter celebration. 
We pray for Robin Reaver, for Bill Korich, Colleen Bradbury, Catherine Smith, Sally Neiheiser, Steve Kennedy, for Don Olson. And we also pray for Lois Miller and especially a, a prayer of thanksgiving that she had a successful eye surgery and continues to recover. We thank God for that. And we also thank God for all the celebrations we have and the milestones he's given to us and especially for the new daughter of Tony and Amy Millard for little Tinley Eleanor. We thank God for that precious gift and that she will soon join us through the waters of holy baptism. And also for the 28th anniversary of Jeff and Sue Entler, for their marriage and life together and for the flowers that have been dedicated to them here on God's altar. And then we also lift up to our God, just our church at large here at St. Paul's, that he would continue to lead and guide us, that everything that we do would just honor and glorify his name, and especially as we look toward our next phase of building, what we have called phase two, and what we are now calling next, our next campaign, that God would just be in and among that process, that he would unite us all together so that when we put our hands and our work together, it's really God just working through us to grow his kingdom, to touch the lives of others. We stand for prayer. Almighty God and Father, we come before you today, floored at what you have done for us. We stand in awe at the cross, Lord, where we saw our sins hang on your son as he hung on the cross for us. Our hearts broke as he cried out, it is finished. But Lord, when he cried out, it is finished, all our pain and sin was taken from us. And as Christ would raise from that empty tomb, when he would come back to life, Lord, we know that that victory is sealed. We thank you for this promised assurance that you have given to us. Lord, let that always be enough for us. Let what your son has done for us always be everything in our lives. Let these other decisions, these other moments of crisis fall by the wayside. That we would always remember what we have in you, Lord. That that would always be priority number one in our hearts and minds. Lord, we come before you so thankful of what you have done. And knowing that you hear us, Lord, we also come before you on behalf of all those who are in need at this time. Who are suffering and hurting, Lord. We ask that you would draw near to them as the great physician of our souls. That you would gather around them, support them in your loving arms. And work through others to bring them care at this time. Lord, we also give you great thanks for all the celebrations we have, especially on this day of celebration. Lord, that we would always remember that all life and good gifts flows from your hands. We thank you for these times. Lord, we also ask that you would continue to guide and lead this church. Grow this church, not to our own glory and our own understanding, but Lord, to your kingdom. That would always be what we do would glorify you and all that you have done for us. We thank you for how you'll do that in Jesus Christ. Lord, we lift up to you all our prayers, those that we have spoken and that have been mentioned today, and all the prayers that are on our hearts and minds as we join together in the prayer that your Son has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the Easter blessing. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his eternal peace. Amen. We join in our closing song.
you to be seated just for uh, about two short minutes. Uh, there, number one, I wanted to tell you about a couple of upcoming announcements. You know, Easter is such a blessed time that it's not an end. It just launches us into the next things. And uh, first of all, on Wednesday night this week, we start the next round of F3. F3 is a, is a midweek opportunity for us to come together, grow and learn. Uh, full complement of courses that we can study 6.30 to 7.30 study time, 5.30 is our, our dinner, and uh, we're having pizza this coming uh, uh, Wednesday night. It's going to be a great time for us to be together. Second thing I want to remind you is that we are ready to launch this phase two thing, and we've been talking about that. The voters really uh, gave us the green light last October and November uh, to press forward with this, to make plans for uh, the next steps here in our congregation. And here in the rest of the month of April and in early May, uh, we're going to launch a capital campaign for that that we call NEXT. It's next things, next steps uh, that we need to take. And uh, I want to just give you a little 95-second introduction to that here this morning uh, to let you know what this is about. So indulge me for just a moment. What an awesome day of celebration. No greater victory has ever existed in the history of the universe than this day of Jesus' victory over sin and death. No greater day will ever be known until he comes again. We are committed to sharing the good news of this victory with our entire community. 
We're especially concerned about telling the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of our Lord. Our vision statement is about getting it right for kids and families. Build a home, change the world. That's the banner we lift high in every ministry area. Strong home environments strengthened by a strong church environment will enable us to accomplish by God's grace what the psalmist wrote about years ago in Psalm 78. This is what he said. What we have heard and known, what our forefathers have told us, we will not hide them from our children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. To urgently move this mission forward, each of us needs to know about the things that are next for us here. Three years ago, God brought us to a beautiful new church home. You know, I think we're more blessed than any of us fully realize with the possibilities that this place holds for our future. A year and a half ago, God brought our early learning center out here with the sale of our Wood Street properties. God has brought us some strong, positive financial years, and we've made amazing progress in almost every area of ministry. We've been richly blessed with some new young leaders, Pastor Doug working with our youth, Jen Powers in our children's ministry. We've been praying, working, planning, and seeking to know what is next in God's plan as we seek to tell the next generation. We're ready to take the next steps. Come next weekend to learn what's next. So we're looking forward to seeing all of you next Sunday to learn what's next. You guys have been awesome. Uh, praise team, you have been absolutely awesome today. Uh, thank you for leading just great worship here among us. Um, you're amazing people of God, and we give praise and thanks to God for you. Greet each other. Pastor Doug and I are going to greet you out here at the doors. Have an awesome day in the Lord. No power of hell, no fear.